This is the Canon 300TL flash unit. It's the dedicated flash for the Canon T90. Back in the film days when camera bodies had dedicated flashes. Later in the video I'll be showing you how to use it. But before I do that I thought it would be interesting and or useful to take a little look at the historical background and also to briefly touch on the basics of flash photography. In the late 70s and early 80s, if you wanted to buy a Canon's best amateur camera, you bought one of these, the Canon A1. By 1986, if you wanted to buy a Canon's best amateur camera, you bought one of these, the Canon T90. The T90 was introduced at an interesting time. Autofocus had actually arrived by then. The Canon T80 had three special lenses that had inbuilt autofocus motors. And this little twin top point and shoot that I bought in the late 80s or early 90s also had also focus. But the EF mount won't be released until another year in 1987. So when the T90 came out, it still had the FD manual focus mount, the same as the A1. However, in that time, there have been enormous advances in electronics. And this camera is superior in absolutely every respect. It quite surprises me actually. I've made videos about both cameras, and a lot of people now are interested in film, but there's far more interest in the A1, and I don't quite understand it, because the T90 is such a better camera. Similarly, because of the advances in electronics, the dedicated flash for the T90, the 300TL, was far superior to the 199A, the dedicated flash for the A1. I'll go over some of the differences later in the video. But when you compare the two, this one is quite prehistoric compared to this one. But before we do that, I thought it might be useful just to look at some flash photography basics. You have to think of flash photography as two separate but simultaneous exposures. And because they're simultaneous, the ISO and the aperture remain constant, but you can control the background exposure by adjusting the shutter speed and you can control the exposure of the subject by adjusting the power and the duration of the flash. In this image, the background exposure looks fine, but if the flash power is too weak or there isn't any flash, then the subject is going to look underexposed. Conversely, if there's too much flash power, the subject is going to look overexposed. Ideally, we want the background exposure and the subject's exposure to be balanced so that we get a natural looking image. It follows that if we want to control the light accurately, we've got to meter the light accurately, and that's the big advantage with the T90 and 300TL compared to the previous generation of camera technology. With the instant feedback we get with digital cameras, we're really spoiled. We can take a shot now, and if it doesn't look right, just dial in some exposure compensation or flash exposure compensation and take it again until it's right. Back in the film days, you wouldn't know the results until you got your film back from the lab, so it was much more critical to get the exposure right at the time of shooting. One of the major improvements with the T90 over the A1 was the metering system. When I changed cameras, I noticed I was getting better shots even though I was using the same lenses and the same film, and that's just because of the metering system. The A1 has quite a primitive metering system. It only has one mode, and it's a kind of centre-weighted average. The C90 has three modes. It has centre-weighted average, partial area, and true spot metering. The 199A A1 combination doesn't have any through-the-lens metering. All it has is this external sensor on the flash unit. This sensor measures the light that's reflected from the subject, and when it thinks the subject has had enough light, it turns off the flash. But what it doesn't do is measure how much light has been exposed to the film. The 300TL also has an external sensor, but the T90 has real through-the-lens metering. There are two through-the-lens metering sensors in the T90. One is located above the eyepiece, and in non-flash photography, it measures the light for centre-weighted average and partial area metering. The other is located in the mirror chamber. For non-flash photography, it's used for spot metering, and with flash photography, it measures the illumination reflected off of the film, so it's much more accurate than the A1. 
The 300TL uses four AA batteries. I'm using Eneloops, and the number of flashes depends on various factors. Obviously, the type of battery you're using and how intense the flashes are. But the, the manual says that with alkaline manganese batteries, you should be able to get up to 700 flashes. The on switch on the 300TL has two positions. If you move it to the first position, it turns the flash on permanently. If you move it to the second position, the flash will turn itself off if it's not used for five minutes to save energy. SE stands for save energy. And the way to wake it up again is just to press the shutter release on the camera halfway down. Both of these flashes have bounce heads, but this one also has a zoom head. And it's got four positions, so set it depending on the focal length of the lens you're using. And these numbers are illuminated as you change position. So 24 mil, 35, 50, and 85. There's a pilot light here, which illuminates when the flash is ready to fire. But unlike the 199A, there's no confirmation light. And the reason for that is the feedback loop. With this one, because there's no through the lens metering, the feedback comes back via the flash, so the flash knows whether there's enough light or not. With through the lens metering, the feedback is through the camera. So to know whether there's enough light or not, you need to be looking through the, the camera viewfinder and checking that there's no blinking lights. With the 199A, you first have to dial in the ISO. With the 300TL, that's not necessary. The T90 can read the DX code on the film canister, and that information is then given to the flash unit. The next thing you have to do with the 199A was to work out the distance between the camera and the subject, and then use this color-coded switch to set the aperture. That's not necessary either with the 300TL. There's an IR sensor, that can measure the distance, and everything is set automatically. The 300TL can be quite complicated to use, but fortunately, there's a fully automatic mode. All you need to do is to put this switch into the P mode, so that this P light illuminates. And regardless of the settings on the camera, the camera will then go into automatic mode. All you need to make sure of is that the aperture ring on the lens is set to A. Just do that. Set the zoom to match the, the focal length of your lens and start shooting and everything will be completely automatic. If you want to use your camera in either aperture or shutter speed priority mode, simply move this switch to the mode set button and press the gray ATTL button. This is the advanced through the lens metering mode. Make sure that the aperture ring on the lens is set to the A position and then choose the aperture or shutter speed that you desire. But bear in mind, you can only have shutter speeds between a 30th and one 250th of a second. The flash will set the metering mode on the T90 to center weighted. And when you press the shutter button halfway down, the IR unit will measure the distance to the subject. When you take the shot, everything will be controlled automatically using the settings you've chosen. The Canon T90 was the first camera in the world to have spot metering for flash photography. And this is where it starts to get really clever. So the first thing we need to do is to put the camera into spot metering mode. You should see a little dot on the LED just to confirm that. And then put the 300TL flash into FEL mode. This is the flash exposure lock. Once we've done that, we can press the the spot metering button, which is just, just behind the shutter release. And when we do that, the flash will do a pre-flash at a 20th of the normal power. The light will hit the subject, be reflected back through the lens, and the internal sensor in the camera will measure the light reflected off the film. And that meter reading will be kept in storage for 30 seconds, so then we can recompose and it will use the, the spot meter reading. But it actually gets cleverer on that. We can use spot metering for flash photography in any exposure mode, but when we use aperture priority, we can do a bit more. 
When we do the pre-flash and look through the viewfinder, on the right hand side we'll see two dots. One is fixed and one is floating. The fixed dot represents the exposure for the subject and the floating dot represents the exposure for the background. And if they aren't balanced, we can use the highlight and shadow buttons on the back of the camera to balance them to get a nice, even, balanced, natural looking photo where the subject exposure and the background exposure are the same. The eagle-eyed among you will notice there are two more positions, manual high and manual low. And in some situations, for example, where you've got a very light background and a very, a very small subject, automatic metering just isn't going to work. The, the situation will confuse the camera and the flash. So you can use one of these manual modes. But to do so, you'll need to get out a calculator. Here's how to do the calculation, and we'll use the metric table to do an example. So if we're using ISO 100 film and a 50mm lens, we get a guide number of 35. An aperture is guide number over shooting distance. So if our shooting distance is 5 meters, the aperture will then be 7. So we'd need to set the aperture to 7.1. And the camera will be automatically set to a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second. Manual low uses a flash intensity, this is 1 16th of manual high, and therefore you need to divide the guide number by 4 for these calculations. I think the only control I haven't described yet is the switch for first curtain or second curtain sync. And in all my years of taking photographs, I've never used second curtain sync. When you do flash photography, the shutter speed is relatively slow. You know, it can be down to a 30th or a 60th of a second. And the duration of the flash is very, very fast. It's milliseconds. The flash will freeze your subject, but it will leave things in the background blurred. So with first curtain sync, the flash fires just as the shutter opens. And with second curtain sync, it fires just as the shutter is about to close. If you pan a shot of a car in low light using very low shutter speeds, with first curtain sync, the car will be frozen and the light trowels will be in front of the car. That doesn't look very natural. But with second curtain sync, the light trowels will be behind the car, which will look a lot more natural. With certain types of shot, or if you're trying to create special effects, second curtain sync can be useful. But as I say, I just tend to use first cut and sync. One thing I didn't describe is what happens when you move the aperture ring away from the A and use your camera in fully manual mode. What happens then is that the flash just goes into TTL mode rather than advanced TTL mode. But it will still do its best to give you the correct flash exposure. My original plan for this video was to include some sample images. But the video is getting quite long now, it's 13 minutes and I, I normally try to keep my videos less than 10 minutes and also it's going to take a few days to get images processed at the lab. So I think I'll wrap it up here now and I'll do another video with some sample images later. If you have any comments or questions please leave them below. Thanks for watching and if you'd like to see more videos like this please subscribe to my channel.